Praise God. We're gonna be in. Uh, we're gonna be in. Well, we're gonna start by reading the book in the book of Leviticus. Thank you, Jesus. Um, if you don't have a, uh, we're gonna take communion after the service is over. So, if you don't have one, uh, Robert had him back there. You could raise your hand. And get one for you. All right, here we go. Leviticus 18, verse 3. Y'all doing okay this morning? Amen. Amen. It's good to have you in the house of the Lord. Amen. Been some beautiful weather out there. Amen. Praise God. Um, I titled this morning's message, message, You're Different Now. I couldn't help myself. You know me. I mean, it was. I just noticed on the calendar the next time I preached was going to be on October the 31st. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so here we go. Uh, you're different now. I just want you to know that this morning. Amen. I want you to know you're different now. Amen. Let's look at Leviticus 18 in verse 3. It says, I love this scripture. It speaks so loudly to me and maybe it'll speak to you. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein you dwelt, shall you not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, where I bring you, shall you not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. You know, what a, what a powerful word to say. Hey, listen, where I brought you from when you were in the land of Egypt, there was a certain behavior going on. And whenever I pulled you out of that place, I don't want you doing what you used to do back then when you were with them. But I also don't want you doing what they're doing where I'm bringing you. Now, you may not be able to buy into this, but for me, that passage speaks loudly and says, hey, Matt, I don't want you reverting backwards. I don't want you living like you did when you were an Egyptian. And I don't want you longing for the things that the world used to offer you. And for them, it was watermelons and leeks and garlics and onions and all these other things. As they traveled through the wilderness, they got tired of the manna that God gave them. Sometimes we get complacent in our life. And sometimes we get greedy for or hungry for other things that are contrary to the will of God in our lives. And we're not learning how to rest and to trust and to believe on God and, and to have a desire for the things of God. And I want you to know this morning that only the Lord can do that work in your heart and in your life. Only God can change your spiritual taste buds. Only God can change the desires of your heart. So the Lord said, I don't want you doing what you used to do in the land of Egypt. But I also don't want you to do what they're doing in Canaan. You see, I, I wish I, well, you know what? I got me a little bit of a, uh, uh, a media, uh, a map. Hey, yeah. look at that map. Yeah. I didn't do it for this message, but I happen to do it. I don't know if I can show you, but look at this. This is Egypt over here. See Egypt at the bottom right there? So that's where the Lord brought them from. And you see that little strip of land over there to the right that says Israel? That used to be called the land of Canaan. Basically, the Lord said, I don't want you going backwards to where you used to be, but also where I'm bringing you. They're doing some stuff over there, and I don't want you doing what they're doing. What I'm here to tell you this morning is this, is that, listen, they're doing some stuff in the church nowadays that the Lord does not want us partaking in what it is that they're doing. And that's Canaan. Just because they call themselves the church, and again, I'm not trying to pretend like we got it all figured out. Nobody else has nothing figured out. That's not what I'm here to do this morning. But what I am here to tell you is, and if you can't see it, Lord, I'm just praying that he'd allow you to see it. That in much of what we call the church, that the church has allowed the spirit of the world, the harlot of Babylon to come in. And the spirit of Babel, the spirit of disobedience that works in, the prince of the power of the air that works in the children of disobedience. And has begun to manipulate the way that church is done. And all this goes back to the concept of mystery Babylon and it's a different spirit, it's not the Holy Spirit. <coughs> The Lord would say, I don't want you doing what you used to do, but I also don't want you doing what they're doing. And listen, you can break that down, and I, I wish that I didn't have to, but sometimes some of these programs, let me, let me just tell you, like, you know, the old church I used to go to, and I'm not picking on them, I'm just using them as an example, because they're everywhere. They had a lot of different small groups, and they had a woman teacher that they would buy her stuff, and guess what? This woman was teaching people things like contemplative prayer 
Well, what is contemplative prayer? It is based upon Eastern mysticism and using mantras like Buddhism. And even though you're repeating the same name, which is Jesus, 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 Jesus said you don't pay, pray in vain repetition like the heathen do. See? And whenever you meditate on the word of God in the Christian sense, you read it, you ponder it, you chew on it, you let it get on inside of your spirit. Then when you meditate according to the Eastern way of doing it, <laughs> you repeatedly say this mantra, whatever it is, it can even be the name of Jesus, and you empty your mind so that another spirit of another kind can come in. So what I'm trying to say is, is that that's just one example of things that are going on in the church. It gets a whole lot worse than that. Don't do what you used to do, but don't do what they're doing over there where I'm bringing you. Because I'm asking you to take a stand and I'm giving you my word. And I want you to live for me according to my word. I don't want you to do what the world does. You're different now. You know, this, the Lord... He wants us to do and he wants us to follow and he wants us to be led by his word. And at the same time, God knows, just like he knew that Egypt was full of magic. He knew that Canaan was full of magic. And I want you to know that in the, same, in the world today, that same spirit that was alive then is still alive today. And I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but I know that I have through the years. And I know that I talk about this kind of stuff a lot, but that the enemy has made a whole bunch of counterfeits along the way. He makes all kind of counterfeits and his purpose is to divert people's attention from the true Jesus, from the true way of walking after God and to try to get people's focus on something else. And sometimes they'll call it Jesus. Sometimes they'll call it whatever they'll call it, but it's not really the real Jesus as described in the Bible, right? And part of that deception is a, it's a system of seasonal holidays. Y'all ready for this? Come on now, don't look at me like, don't get all mad at me. I'm just trying to tell you what the Lord showed me, and you take it with a grain of salt. If you don't like it, it's okay. You come back next Sunday, we still love each other. All right? Oh. But it's a system of seasonal holidays that move us through each stage of the year while keeping us so preoccupied with the festivity, and that somehow our focus on Jesus gets lost in all the fanfare. Come on, somebody. I just told you a big old mouthful of truth. Right I'm about to break it down for you. Part of that is, 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 is let's talk, start with Christmas. I know today is October 31st, but I just want to make a couple of points here. Let's start with Christmas. Take Christmas, for instance. It's a Christian holiday, right? Okay, well, if so, then who in the heck is Santa Claus? Am I allowed to say that in the, behind the pulpit? Who is Santa Claus? I'm just trying to make a point. Who is Santa Claus? I'm not going to tell you who I think he is, but, but nevertheless, is it really about the birth of Jesus anymore? Okay. Uh, for the angels of heaven that night, it was about his birth. Right. So I'm here to tell you, look, look, we can take a look right now. Luke chapter two. Let's take a look at that real quick. Luke chapter two. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to just go to verse 14, but look, it says that Mary brought forth her, forth her firstborn son. The baby was wrapped in swaddling clothes and there were shepherds in the field at night. And guess what happened? The angels of the Lord showed up and they spoke to those shepherds. And look what they said. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Look at verse 15. It came to pass as the angels were going away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to one another, well, look, I went, I, I, should, I went too far. Let me go back up here a little bit. Sorry about that. Verse 12. This shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger. And suddenly, that's what I wanted you to see. Suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts. That means a multitude of angels showed up. Praising God and saying. Okay. What I want you to try to envision this in your mind. You're just an old shepherd guy in a field somewhere outside of Bethlehem tending to your sheep it's nighttime and then all of a sudden an angel of God shows up and he has a word for you but then in the midst of that all of a sudden a multitude I mean I'm talking about I'm guessing heaven opened up I don't know for sure heaven opened up and the heavenly choir showed up and they started to sing a song and what they said was glory to God in the highest and on earth peace you've been missing peace 
But I got good news for you. We, the Prince of Peace has now been born. The plan that God had from the beginning of time that he would send the Messiah. He would send the anointed one. The one that you've been waiting for as the chosen people of God named Israel. You've been told about him. The pagan nations around you didn't know that he was coming. But you were supposed to have the light on the inside of you to allow the world around you to know that he was coming. Good news, good news. Peace on earth, good will towards men. He's been born this night in the city of David. Hallelujah. Amen. Listen to me. They can talk about, oh, Christmas is a pagan holiday. He wasn't born on December 25th. Yeah, yeah, maybe so, probably so. Guess what? All I know is this, that angels right. yeah. sang that night. So I don't care when we celebrate it. We ought to celebrate it every day. Why? Because the nativity took place in my heart. Hallelujah. The nativity took place in your heart if you're born again. Every day ought to be the birthday of Jesus. But nevertheless, what I'm trying to say is I know it ain't no place for Santa Claus in this all that. Oh, you're just a mean preacher. No, no, no. I don't want nothing that's going to take the glory away from Jesus. That's right. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Who gets the glory? All good gifts come from our Father in heaven. Hallelujah. And he gave us the greatest gift of all. I don't even want to preach against all that stuff, but I'm just saying, look, we used to be in competition. Who's going to give the next person a better gift? We're so caught up in all that kind of stuff, and what we fail to realize is that God gave us the greatest gift of all. Jesus. It's a counterfeit. It's a counterfeit to get your focus off of the one who deserves glory and honor. We're here in this place to exalt the name of Jesus. But not only that, look. What about the resurrection? <laughs> uh oh. And I got my wife mad at, mad at me in the past. Amen. What about the resurrection? Are we really celebrating the resurrection of our Savior? Or are we participating in the rituals of the occult world when we die Ishtar's eggs? Are we giving glory to our resurrected Savior? Or are we mysteriously giving credence to the goddess of fertility? Mm -hmm. Of course you're not doing any of this uh, on purpose. Uh, of course you love the Lord. But if you were Satan, I just got a question. If you were Satan uh, and wanted to pull glory away from the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, what would you do? Would this be part of your plan? Creating some novel and fun festivities that everyone could get excited about and be convinced that it was only about fun and that there was no harm in any of it? Through the ages and stages of life, the so-called church has found ways to adopt these pagan forms of worship and make them acceptable to the church. Why? Because it's fun and I want to have fun. Why do we do it? Because everybody else did it before us. Listen. In 1 Peter 1.18, it says, You were not redeemed with corruptible things from your, from your former way of, with the, with the, uh, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your former way of life, I'm paraphrasing, that you received from the traditions of your fathers, but instead with the precious blood of a lamb, which was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. Yes, in the context of that passage, it's talking specifically about the vain or empty traditions of the law that were filtered down. But guess what? There's all kind of empty and vain traditions that we've received from the people that came before us. In the end, you do what you want to do. But what I'm trying to say is, is that sometimes we hold on to things and there was no reason really for it in our life to begin with. Because it's not giving glory to the Lord. And in some way, shape, or form, we're still staying connected. Here's another one, Fat Tuesday. You know, the church endorses, I'm saying the church, quote unquote the church, endorses that because we clean that up with Ash Wednesday. Right? I still, I still get confused whenever I see people on Ash Wednesday when I walk up in the store and they got that ash on their head. I forget what that was about, but I just wanted to show you something real quick. We're hustling up. Just hang in there with me. In, look at this. This is what the word of the Lord says. Because, because you know what? I know that there's people that still go to Mardi Gras parade. And, and, it is, and, and, and whatever. That's, that, that, that's up to you. If that's what you want to do. But I'm not, don't get mad at me because I'm going to talk, talk about it. Because it's in the Bible. Amen. Amen. And, and, and you know, people are still going to do it. But look at this word right here. Revelings. I'm going to kind of screenshot this. I'm going to open it up for you a little bit. Try to get a little bit bigger. This is the word. Lust of the flesh is called a reveling. This is the definition in the Strong's. A revel, carousal, 
nocturnal and riotous procession of drunken men and frolicsome fellows who after supper parade through the streets with torches and music in honor of Bacchus or some other deity. The word of the Lord said, don't do it. Okay. And so whenever we engage and bring ourselves out there, now let me, let me make myself clear here. If you're out there with some tracks in your hand that's talking about salvation of Jesus, and you're handing those things out to people and you're saying, hey, brother, sister, I'm just here to tell people about the love of the Lord. That's why I'm here. I just want to, hey, what do you know about Jesus? Do you know, what do you think about Jesus? Oh, I think Jesus is cool. Look, I just want to hand you this right here. When you get a chance, read it later. And then you'll be surprised how many conversations. Oh, but that makes me feel a little bit weird. I get it. I'm pretty sure Jesus felt kind of weird carrying the cross up the hill. But what I'm trying to say is this. Is that if you aren't out there being separated for the Lord, then now you're part of what they're doing. That's right. Come on. That's right. I'm either telling the truth or I'm a liar. That's right. I can remember one time my daughter said, Daddy, we want to, why don't we go to parades? <clears throat> and uh, I said, well, because it's, it's, a, pagan, it's a pagan ritual. Yeah. And, and it's not giving glory to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, all my friends that go to church go. I'm like, oh, okay, so you feel like your daddy's making you miss out on something. All right. Well, okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you go with your friends, your Christian friends, to the parade, and you come back and you give me a report on what you saw and what you what you felt like. Okay. All right. So they come back, and what they say, I had, what did you think about it, baby? I, mean, oh, I didn't see nothing wrong with it. Oh, you, you didn't notice all them people getting drunk, sloppy drunk, and acting like a fool? Or you chose not to see it. See, now... You got your chance to make your decision. Now I realize you're still too immature right. to make decisions for yourself, which I already knew that. But And I'm your daddy. And so guess what? I'm going to continue to make the decisions for you. Now, when you become of age and you're old enough to make your own decision, you might still do that. And unfortunately, in many ways, they have. Right? But, but my job as a father to, that understands the truth of the word of God, my job as a pastor is to... Is to Bring the word of the Lord to the people and to allow people to make their own decisions for themselves. Amen? And I get it. People in the, in the congregation or people definitely watching on video, maybe not y'all, are saying, come on, dude. It's just all about fun. And you know, Danielle brought up something last night. We were driving back from Baton Rouge and she said, well, you know, I've heard some people open up their homes and they prepare these little packages and they have like some tracks in there. And I'm like, okay, okay. Checkmate. You, you kind of got me a little bit, maybe. If they, but I, don't, I still don't agree with it. I still don't agree with it. But at least you can have an argument that you was trying to give me. But, but, in this, but in reality, most of the time, people are just trying to justify their actions. Now, I could see this. Me walking from door to door. The Lord hasn't led me to do this. But knocking on doors with my kids. I am not coming here to get candy, sir. I'm coming here to tell you the good news of Jesus. Tonight's the night that we knock on doors. And so I just wanted you to know, I got a gift for you, sir, to tell you that Jesus yeah. loves you and he died for you. See, I can see that. Yeah. But I don't see the other thing. So now we get to the Halloween thing. What about Halloween? Salween. How is this even remotely godly? Oh yeah, because the Catholic Church calls it All Hallows' Eve or Saints' Day. You know, they call this a threshold festival. That's why whenever I was praying earlier, I said, when I prayed, and I didn't know they were playing that song about he ripped the veil. What's believed is that the threshold on this night is thin. In the occult pagan world, they believe that this threshold that separates the physical from the spiritual, this is their origins of this festival. That they believe that the, the veil that separates the physical from the spiritual is thinned upon this night because this is the darkest area where we're moving into the dark of winter. And they believe that, that and, and so they believe that communication with the dead is more easily achieved right, right. on this night. So that's where the origins of this type of. Now, listen, I, I'm not going to go back to the map and I'm not going to bore you with details, but I do, I do like to repeat this kind of concept. So that we understand, because it's kind of a deep concept. When you look at the Tower of Babel and Babylonian mystery religion, okay, that, that's all the way down where Iraq is. That's where mystery Babylon began. The Lord warns us that it's still present today. It's not going to be destroyed till Revelation 17 and 18. 
But in the Tower of Babel, under the leadership of Nimrod, they were taught the mystery religions. When God confused their languages, the people groups began to spread across the land. Mystery religions were in the land of Canaan, which is modern-day Israel. They were in Egypt. They were in Asia Minor, Turkey, and all that stuff. You can still see evidence because they got those crazy-looking poles and pyramids all over the world. But guess what? In Britain, it finally made its way over there to Eastern and Western Europe. They got Stonehenge over there. That's where Samhain started, was over there in Europe. It's a Celtic form of pagan worship. Now, how does the church or the quote-unquote church absorb that? Because the quote-unquote Catholic church already believes in praying to the dead. Right. See, they believe in praying to the saints. But I got to tell you, that's not the word of God. That's right. And so, therefore, they can absorb it because now the, the veil is thinner and we have easier access to pray to the saints. But the word of God says... In, in Timothy, it says it right here. Let's go ahead and go to it. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. It clearly says this. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. A mediator is a go-between. That means that there's only one way for you and I to get to the Lord, and it's through Jesus. And the way that Jesus made that possible is he didn't thin the veil. He tore the veil. He made a way. And when he said that it was done. When he died on the cross, Matthew 27 and 51, he said, it is finished. The Bible says that the earthquake, the sky turned black, and that the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. Joseph said it was more than four inches thick, and that two yoke of oxen couldn't have pulled it apart. Did you hear what I said? It didn't rip from the bottom to the top where a man could have done it. It ripped from the top to the bottom because God took his hand and ripped it, signifying, hallelujah, that the way into the holy of Holies has now been made. We're not looking for a thin veil church. We're looking for a ripped veil so that we can enter in to the and there's only one way to get there. And his name is Jesus. And the reason that you can get there is because he died on the cross, then he paid the penalty for the sins of mankind. And when you put your faith in that, come on, somebody, help me out. It's not about your righteousness. It's not about the preacher's righteousness left to yourself, left to myself. We're nothing but a bunch of our righteousness is our filthy rags before the face of the Lord. But he sent us Jesus, the beautiful one, the holy one, the obedient one. He said, it is my need to do my father's will. He never once did it wrong. He never once failed the father. And what he did was he took that perfect humanity and he offered it up on the cross as a payment for the failure of the first Adam. And he made it right. Hallelujah. And when you put your faith in that. Whether you knew it or not. Whether you knew it or not. You didn't even have to know all that my friend. For the conversion to take place. All you had to know was that you were a sinner. And needed yeah. a savior. All you had to do was invite him in. Lord Jesus my life is a mess. Father, my life is a mess, and I believe you sent Jesus. See, that's why we got to preach the truth. That's why sometimes talking about sin and darkness offends people. But we got to tell them the truth. The preacher still needs to be able to have enough backbone to say, Hey, there's a world out there that's lost and blind, and they're walking in the wrong direction. And sin will destroy your life. But good news, the Father wrote a prescription. His name is Jesus. And the answer, he died on the cross. And if you'll accept that and receive that into your heart, he'll change you. Yeah. He'll give you the righteousness. Yeah. He'll clothe you with the righteousness of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will move in. Yeah. And he'll start changing you on the inside. Yeah. See, I don't know about you, but I need the Lord to change me. Yeah. I need the Lord to change me on the inside. I need That's him right. to change my mindset. I need him to change my heart. And in the end, sooner or later, he's going to start changing my actions. Oh, yeah. and the more, like that song sung, the more we start bringing it to the foot of the cross, the more we start surrendering it. See, I've always said this. I mean, I don't say I always said this, but as soon as I understood it, I always said it. The problem is not with the Lord. Amen. Can I get an amen out there? Amen. The problem is not with the, the plan of the Father. The problem is not with the execution of the Son. The problem is not with the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit. The problem is not with the truth of the Word. The problem is you and I. 
Amen. The Apostle Paul said the law is holy. I am carnal, sold under sin. That's the problem, church. The problem is our hard heads, our hard hearts, our stiff necks. Come on, somebody. Help me. I'm preaching to the preacher. The Lord wants us to come in agreement with him and his word and to surrender those things at the altar of the Lord. Amen. And for him, and then, and guess what? What's going to happen is he'll start to work in our hearts and lives. I just want you to know there's a mediator between God and man. His name isn't Francis of Assisi. His name isn't, you know, Joseph the, or whoever the protector. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. And I don't mean that to be offensive. I'm just telling the truth. That's the only way I know how to do it. His name is Jesus. And he's the one that we're to look to. In 2 Corinthians, it talks about, listen, you're different now. I want you to know that. Amen. Amen. I want you to know that you're different now. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. It says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? I'm just going to go ahead and stop. It goes on to say this. And what concord has Christ with Belial? What is Belial? That's like the devil. That's another name for the devil. What, what connection or association is there supposed to be bet between light and darkness? What kind of, is there supposed to be fellowship between light and darkness? Well, I mean, you know what I'm talking about? Fellowship, it describes, that word describes to me some level of intimacy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like camaraderie, common union. In other words, look, you might work with somebody that's an unbeliever. I'm not trying to ever preach isolationism. But I will preach separatism. In other words, the Lord has called us to be separate. You're different now, but he's never called you to be isolated. Sometimes there are certain points in our life where we come together with unbelievers. Work is one of them. School is one of them. Walmart might be one of them. A person from our past. But I'm telling you right now, and, and maybe even coming in from town, you better be led by the Lord on. We're coming in from town on a long journey from many, many years away, and your old partner calls you up, and you got the strength of the Lord in you, and he calls you up. I was talking to somebody the other day, Randy Prado's brother. He said, man, my partner said, hey, come over here and visit. Back like, like, you know, it's been a while since I've seen you. And he said, okay, I went over there. And he said, hey, dude, you got some brewskis in the refrigerator and got one rolled up. And he's like, yeah, well, guess what? But man, I ain't that man no more. I'm more than happy to come over here and tell you hi and catch up a little bit, but I'm different now. And I don't do those things. I wouldn't recommend you keep on going over there, though, every day and keep telling him the same thing. Because sooner or later, he's going to start trying. He's going to light one up and like let you sniff it or whatever he's going to do to try to get you to start breaking down. Because even though he don't need it, the enemy wants to use him as a vessel to get you to go backwards. Right. What fellowship does light have with that? You're not supposed to be in common union or communion with the world. So why in the world are we, are we engaging in all their festivities? Right. Oh, because it's kind of fun and it's neat and it's like, you know, why can't we do the things that the Lord in the church wants us to do? Is it because it's just not fun? Listen, I get it. I'm just kind of talking now, but when I first got saved, I'm telling you, I've told the story before. Danielle had some dude on there named Brian Duncan. I don't remember what the song was. And I just thought to myself, man, that Christian music, bro, they need to step it up a notch. <laughs> they need to, dude, they I mean, okay, it's okay, but they, they far, they inferior to, to the stuff I've been listening to. Listen, they got some awesome Christian artists. Yes. Okay. And, but I got to tell you something. There's another spirit behind that stuff that's going on. How do you know? Because they got a different message, man. They got a different message. And I mean, I'm not going to start sitting here trying to sing these old secular songs I used to listen to. But they got a different message and they're enticing people's flesh. Amen. I can remember back when I was a, a goofy teenager and I can, I, uh, it was like 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm not bragging about this. I'm not proud of this. But it was about 8 o'clock in the morning. I had been drinking all night. I had a beer in my hand. And the, the guy was like, dude, what are you doing? And I smashed the beer on my head. And I said, I'm into self-destruction, man. And, you know, whatever, drugs and rock and roll. You know, and I thought that was cool. I was convinced in my mind from the culture that I was living in, which was surrounded by the music, 
by the communion with the people of the world, by the things that we were doing and the things that we were engaging in. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you the truth. Right, right. There's a spirit behind all of that yeah. that's trying to drive us. And I just don't want to be part of that anymore. Amen. I'm so thankful that the Lord changed me enough and it's all his doing. It ain't none of my doing. I didn't wake up one morning and say, oh, I'm going to be a God chaser today. No, the Lord, what did the song sing? The song, well, how did it go? It said, uh, he, huh? He's running after me. Yeah. Yeah, right? His goodness is running after me. Did you catch that? In spite of you not running after him. In spite of the times of your life and the seasons of your life, when you didn't do what you were supposed to do, I'm telling you, it might have seemed like it was silent and a little bit dark in that moment of time, but he was still running after you. His goodness was still coming after you. He's not going to give up on you. He's, he, he's going to stick closer, hallelujah, than a, than a brother. He's a friend that loves you. He proved his love. He laid his life down. That's what I'm really trying to say. You're different. And we're, not, and we're supposed to have a desire for the different things. And if we're not there yet, because guess what? Our flesh will fight it. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Your flesh will fight it. I'm telling you right now, every time you come up in this house, and the Lord, and sometimes it's going to be because I got an irritating personality. I get that. And the Lord's still working on me. But sometimes it's going to be because it's the Holy Spirit convicting and, and poking a spot in your heart that the Lord don't want there no more. Amen? And guess what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to submit to that. Yeah. I know that I pray, Lord, please help my personality. Don't drive them. Don't, don't let me drive them away just because they don't like the way I act. If it be your word that offends them, then so be it. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Listen, so don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Let's take a look real quick. We're almost done here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6. It says, let no man deceive you with vain words. Like, in other words, people are going to tell you that something's okay, but it don't mean that it is true. For because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For you were sometimes darkness. See, that's who you used to be when you lived in Egypt, my friend. You were born into darkness. You were part of that system. But now you are light in the Lord. Therefore, walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Rather reprove them. In other words, expose them. I remember having a conversation with the old pastor at the old church. And he's like, you know, man, I was, I was walking around over there at Lake Lord, doing a little jog and a walk. He said, you know, man, I find that you're always trying to defend the faith. And one of the things that I've learned is, is that, you know what, God's a whole lot. He's real big and he doesn't need me. To, and I said, well, what about the Apostle Paul, brother? He said, contend for the faith. Because there's many, a, there's a spirit that's trying to bring lies into the midst of the church. And the Lord wants his ministers and his people that are called by his name to understand the word of the Lord and to contend for the faith. Yeah. Listen to me, church. If the Lord should tarry another 10, 15, 20 years and you and I go on to be with the Lord, there, God will always have a witness in this land. You hear me? Matt can put his head down on his pillow tonight and not wake up. And I guarantee the Lord knows how to rise somebody up. Amen. 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 He will always have a witness in the land. But he's looking for a witness with a truth in his mouth. Yes. He's looking for a witness that's willing to stand for the truth. We don't want ambiguity. We don't want a gray area. It needs to be black and white because the Lord is black and white. Amen. His word is black and white. Yes. Amen? Amen. Listen, we all know. We, we fall short. Even while I was up there praying, worshiping the Lord for that song. Your goodness. How did it go again, sister? <laughs> you made a way, but the goodness of God. Oh, chasing me. That was I. The goodness of God chasing me. And I was just thinking to myself. It's like in spite of myself, your goodness chases me. In spite of myself, your goodness overwhelms me. Amen. And as I was sitting there, I was thinking, it's the goodness of 
That leads a man to repentance. Yes. But you know what? Sometimes some people in the church will do. They'll twist that. So why are you not a little sweeter, preacher? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about something at a whole other level. We're talking about the Spirit of God revealing to the heart of man right. how good God is. Yeah. And sometimes it can come from a bold message. God will use it however he chooses to use it. Danielle told me a story about somebody that been coming to this church. Used to go to, used to, go to church over there in Galilee. Told message Danielle and said, I received a dream. And the Lord said, I was walking on the beach. And the Lord said, let's look at this. And what the Lord showed him was, why are you drinking and smoking cocaine? And he said, I'm telling you, it was so vivid on the whole wow, that the Lord ministered. You see, wow. we all got stuff that we got going on, and it doesn't mean that we don't love the Lord. Yes. Yes. He told it in the book of Isaiah, in the midst of it. If you read the whole Bible, you'll see sometimes he's harsh and he's very corrective. But even in Isaiah, in the beginning, he said, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they will be made white as wool. Let us have a sit down and let us talk about this. Let us really consider what my word says and what's going on in your life. God's good like that, Christian. Amen. He's good like that. Praise God. And he says, rather reprove them. A change of the heart produces a change in desires. You're different now. Amen? A change in the heart produces a change in desires. Sometimes the reason we don't want change is because we're timid or fearful of rejection from others. We may lose friends, but I can promise you this. I can promise you this, Christian. If you will press in towards the Lord, he will reward you with more of a desire to serve him more. You know, I wanted to close with these two scriptures. You ready? Acts. I thought this was interesting. We studied this a while back when Vince had asked a question about something. I don't remember when we did it on, on it was online. <laughs> but look at this scripture right here. And many that believed. Now I realize that everybody that's going trick-or-treating isn't purposefully practicing sorcery. Okay, so I don't want you to think that I believe that. But it says, many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. And many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. When the Holy Spirit moves into a person's heart, he will begin to convict them of the things that are in their life. Now listen, our mind will start talking our way out of that. If our flesh wants to hold on to it. But something very powerful happened right here in the book of Acts. These men heard the gospel. These men and women heard the gospel. They gave their heart to Jesus. The Holy Spirit moved in. And they became convicted of the things that they were doing. About this magic. About this evil. About this darkness. And the word of God says they started burning the books. And I was witnessing to somebody the other day about a different religion and some other nurse overheard it and he said, I mean, I want the truth, but I don't want just the 180. I want the 360. I don't know about burning no books. I'm like thinking to myself, I didn't. I'm like, just say whatever you got to say. But did you, do you even know the passage? If a book is a lie, burn it. That's right. If a book is a lie, burn it. Don't play with it. All right, this is the last thing and I'm closing with this and we're gonna take communion together. Acts chapter two, verse 42. This is what we're supposed to do. Amen? Get rid of the old stuff and embrace the new stuff. You ready? This is what they did in the book of Acts after the Lord got a hold of their hearts. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. That's the new life of the Christian. Not hanging out with the old friends and going trick-or-treating with the kids. Not, hey, we're going to the parade on Tuesday. You coming with us? Not, uh, we're going to glorify Santa Claus. Oh, baby, look, Santa Claus got you all these presents. I, I, listen, I'm, I'm not going to even apologize because what I'm saying is the truth. That's right. That's not what we're supposed to do. Hold on to all that. This is what we're supposed to do. And listen, if it don't sound fun to you, if it doesn't sound like something you want to do, can I, can I, what, can I be so bold and also kind as to say 
It's not God's plan. Amen. It, it's not that God's plan is not good. It's not that Jesus didn't execute it. It's not that the Holy Spirit doesn't want to lead and guide us. It's kind of like the children of Israel in the wilderness. I'm getting tired of this manna from heaven. I want some melons, some leeks, and some garlic. What we need is for the Lord to change the desires of our heart. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's the word of God that describes Jesus. Fellowship, that means fellowshipping with the saints. Common union with the people of God. Amen? And the breaking of bread. Every time we take communion, we're reminded of the cross of Jesus Christ. So we can go 